from the start here module is how you get to the book and also your homework, right? If you have not registered for the book and you have a computer with you right now, do it right now, okay? And send me an email, because that's a problem. Um, two, week one, this was last week, right? And that was the readings that we did last week. And then this is this week, we have Federalist Papers. And then we have today's lecture and the questions for today. So if you'll see, I don't know where that one's up there. I think it should be 124. Um, but this is the questions for today. 126, 220. And then here's the lecture, right? And so if you use the questions, somebody asked me, they said, hey, I wasn't sure where to turn those in. You don't turn them in. The whole purpose of them, the entire purpose of them is so that you have them and you focus during the lecture and then you can use those as a study guide for the exam. Uh, other bits of housekeeping, remember you have labs on Friday, number one, and some of them have been moved to be a little bit more convenient for you, all right? So, in particular, the two in this class that were in Sarkis, how many were in Sarkis? Raise your hand. Yeah. Um, you have been moved to where, Eric? D Dale 116. To Dale Hall 116? Okay, and then Eric's class that was in Burton and, Adam. and Adams um, are in Dale 107. So are, both, are both in Dale Hall 107, okay? So if you were in Eric's sections and you're having to hoof it to Burton, right? Or you were going to Adams before, you're now in Dale Hall 107. And you should receive a notice of that, but if you don't, this is me telling you that right now. Again, the questions are for you. You have workbook chapter three that's due on Canvas at lab time, and then your second chapter of homework that's under the Cengage is due for you. Um, it's due for you. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. I'm going to download the right one. Um, it's due for you um, before class on Monday. So here, the lecture is right here. You can download it if you want to. I'm going to download it right now so I can go through it with you. But the questions will help you focus, all right? Theoretically downloaded it. There we go. All right. I probably downloaded it six times now. All right, you guys answered a question at the end of class. Uh, oh, and just a reminder, you do have to wear masks in class through next Monday, okay? So I see a couple of you without masks. You need masks, okay? Cover your mouth and nose. I saw somebody over here too. Be sure to wear a mask. Eric has some spare ones if you need it, okay? This is to protect the other people around you, okay? Because you may not know that you have symptoms, but you do. So please do wear a mask. That is university policy through next Monday. You guys answered a question in class. Eric, right here. Um, you guys answered a question in class on Monday. Um, which did you think was most important to a democratic republic? Part of what we do in political science is we do do some polling and some statistical analysis. This is to give you an idea of kind of what those polls are like. So one of the things, if we were to critique this poll that we would talk about, is what's most important in the democratic republic. I asked 178 of you to, well, 178 of you responded. So that's my N of 178. And the date of the poll was 124. So that tells us a couple of things. It tells us how many people responded. I can also say that was taken out of this class at the University of Oklahoma, right? It tells us where we got our sample from. But what can you critique about that? What can you say about that? Yeah. Small sample size, okay? It certainly wouldn't tell us what the University of Oklahoma as a whole thought. 
It certainly wouldn't tell us what the state of Oklahoma or the United States, right? But it's a pretty good sample for this class. It's a pretty good sample for this class, okay? Um, the date of the poll also tells us something else. What does it tell us? The current state of public opinion, right? And that's the whole thing with public opinion polls. Public opinion changes, okay? And so this is the current state of this class's opinion about this question. I've also included the question, what's most important to a democratic republic? And I put most there, you know, so that kind of tells us, you know, that we're ask, asking you to rank what you think is most important. But I only give you four options, right? And so these, out of these four options, what do you think is most important? That may not be. There may be something else that you thought was much more important that wasn't an option, okay? And so when we look at polls, think about that. Who's being asked? When are they being asked? How big is the sample size? What's the question, right? And then were they given a choice or were they allowed to make their own decision on that? Okay, and sometimes, you know, you do the best that you can, right? So this is kind of the best that I can do with the class. But I can't say, hey, this is what America thinks, can I? I can say what this class thinks, right? So freedoms of belief, speech, press, association, access, government, 44%. That's pretty normal. That's pretty much what I normally get is somewhere between 40 and 60 on that one. It's right in there. My other class got 54%. That's where they were. The rule of law, no one is above the law, 28%. That's pretty high. That's a, one of the higher ones that I have had on this question. Um, but equality of persons in law, in fact, and rule of law often go back and forth in terms of which one people think are more important between those two. In the other class, that was 18, and then that one was 22, right? Just get, so it kind of pooled from that freedoms of belief. And then a well-educated and participatory electorate um, the other class was at 7%, this is 6 yeah. You do attendance through your app on your phone, right? And so we're going to do attendance in just a minute, okay? And so if you haven't downloaded the app on your phone, but you've already registered for the book, then you download the app and you register on the app with the same registration, okay? And today is the first day that attendance counts. So... If you have a problem with it, let us know after class. Let's talk a little bit about the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution, the men who framed the Constitution, were a group of people that were um, in accord in terms of the way that they saw human nature. They said, people are self-interested. What's self-interest? You're looking after yourself, your interest, who you identify with, okay? And one of the key things in the way that you phrased that was really good because that idea of who you identify with means it's also the way you see the world, right? My self-interest may not be quantified the same way your self-interest is. Your self-interest may be, for example, hey, I want to get ahead, I want to succeed, I want to make a lot of money, I want to live in a big house. Right? That has never been my self interest, which is not to say that I'm not self interested. Right? It's just that my self interest is different. My perspective is different. Right? Can anybody guess what some of my self interest things are? Yes? Sure, I would absolutely want to get paid more. I do. But that's not really my self-interest. But, but it's it's in my self-interest. I don't disagree with that. <coughs> yeah. Pursuit of Say it again. Pursuit of knowledge. Pursuit of knowledge. Absolutely. That's absolutely in my self-interest. That's something I really... My husband actually sometimes gets upset with me because he watches a tremendous amount of documentaries. And I'm done. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I end up watching them, but I don't enjoy it, right? Um, and he's like, I don't understand why you hate knowledge. I'm like, I don't hate knowledge. I just don't want that knowledge, 
right? And so my self-interest is even pointed, right? I don't want to learn more about Hitler. I don't care. I mean, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I know enough, right? I've seen enough. Yeah, I don't have to see another one, right? He was, he turned on the television the other day and he said, uh, it's not about Hitler. And I said, it's called Munich, the edge of war. <laughs> and he said, okay, it's about Hitler. And so, but the point is, is that, you know, my, even my pursuit of knowledge is maybe different than somebody else's, right? And I like to learn things, absolutely. Like, for example, I'm interested in the manatees in Florida right now, and that has nothing to do with anything that interests me, though. But so that's my self interest. Can you name something in your self interest that's not necessarily monetary? Yeah. Basketball? Just playing basketball, being great at basketball? Enjoying basketball? Watching, playing, wanting to be good, okay? Achieving in basketball, achieving in a sport or in a pursuit, right? Maybe being the top of your field, right? And sometimes that comes with money, right? And sometimes it doesn't, right? Which one matters more to you? Sometimes they're twined together, right? What else? Self-interest. How about you guys over here? Give me the self-interest you have. Sleep. sleep. Yeah, sleep is an absolute self-interest, but it's critical, right? And I will tell you guys this too. You need sleep, all right? At your age, if you're not getting between, listen, Eric is some sort of robot. So <laughs> do not listen to him on this. Statistically, you need between seven and nine hours of sleep to have your full IQ power. Do you need your full IQ power? I know I do. All right, at your age, that's what you need. Yeah. What? Train? Just training, okay. So, you know, part of that is being fit, right? Maybe part of it is being the best in your field at a particular area. So what do you play? You have a certain thing? What, you wrestle? Okay, so you want to be the best wrestler, right? And so it's important to you to train that's in your self interest, and it has nothing to do with money, right? Okay, so what else? What's in your self interest? Self interest. Oh, yeah, self interest. My education. What? My education. Your education. Right? You want to get as much out of this as you can. Yeah. I want to be known for something. You want to be known for something. You want to be famous. All right. And so maybe you want to be known for, you know, I don't know, Kim Kardashian wanted to be known for the way that she lived her life. Right? And that was successful. She succeeded at that. That's her self interest. Right? What do you want? And, and understand. Now, when we talk about self-interest, you know, part of my self-interest is honestly to be a really good teacher. I want you to be citizens. I want you to walk out of this class and say, hey, I got something out of this, and I know how to participate more, and I'm going to do it. That would be ideal. Right? And even though you're pursuing your own self-interest, that is in my self-interest that you do it okay so it's not necessarily selfish but it can be right madison says the government needs to check and contain that self-interest that ambition now madison was in favor of ambition all right because what does ambition do put your name wrestler Caleb, your ambition to be the best means you're going to do what? You're going to train harder, and what are you going to do for your sport? You're going to make it better, right? Because you're better, your sport's better, right? And so when you think about those things, when you think about how to make yourself better, Actually, 
you end up making whatever field it is that you're following better, right? I often think I really should have gone into marine biology because I really like the ocean and whales. And I, and I believe in saving the whales. I like large ocean mammals, right? But I didn't. Because ultimately, my self-interest was like, yeah, I really like those things. I just mentioned the manatees, too, for goodness sake. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I really like those things. But my ambition lied somewhere else. And because of that, Madison's going to say that's great. That's my phone. I'm sorry about that. Madison's going to say that's great because you're making your field better. But it needs to be checked. Why does ambition need to be checked? Why do other people in my field need to be there? Also with ambition. <laughs> if I push my ambition too far, if I start breaking rules, what happens? The system breaks down. Right? And so if he's talking about power, if he's talking about ambition um, to bring home more money for your state, ambition to be known and famous and therefore, you know, be honored in your state, he says, that's great. But somebody from somewhere else also needs to be checking on that. Right? There needs to be a check to ambition so that my ambition is pushing the board, pushing, it's pushing. But there's somebody else challenging me the whole way, right? Caleb, no matter how hard you train, if there's nobody to wrestle, do you get any better? Of course not, right? You just can't. You have to be pushed. You have to be checked. Madison's also going to say that the distribution of wealth is the cause of political conflict. The distribution of wealth is a cause of political conflict. Now, Marx is going to say the same thing 100 years later, right? They're going to come to very different conclusions, right? <laughs> Madison is going to say, because of this, we're going to have factions arise out of the unequal distribution because there's a dangerous faction, the majority who have little or no property. You got to watch out for them. Did Madison have some property? Yeah, he was doing okay. And Madison writes on property. And Madison, understand Madison's a genius. He's the first graduate student in the United States at age 17. Madison's doing okay, but when he talks about property, he's talking about, sure, land and money and resources. But he's also talking about talent and hard work and ambition. And he says, the minority of people are going to have more of this, and it has to be protected by government from the majority who don't have and are seeking to take it away. And so it has to be protected, which is not to say that he doesn't think that majority should have a say. He just thinks there needs to be a balance so that neither the majority nor the minority wins all the time. There has to be a balance. In 10 and 51, which you guys read, there's a summary of 10 and a summary of 51 if you didn't read it to kind of give you an easier time of it. Madison talks about a couple of things. He talks about factions, and he says factions come from what? What do factions stem from? Unequal distribution of wealth, right? But something else. Varied opinions and interests, which we have because we have what? Self what? Self-interest. Self but the liberty the liberty to seek that self-interest. And he says, listen to me. Liberty is to faction 
like air is to fire. Without air, fire is suffocated. Without liberty, factions are suffocated. But without air, we also can't do what? Breathe. He said, and so we need to recognize that factions will exist because liberty is so much more important. But we need to contain it. We need to contain it. He sees that this system of government that he has created, and he takes something from Montesquieu, right? Uh, Montesquieu says, hey, look, there needs to be a separation. There is a separation of powers in government. There is the making of laws. There's the executing of laws. And there's the interpreting or the decision making when laws conflict, right? So the legislative, the executive, the judicial branches. And Madison takes that to form the government, but then he does something genius. He doesn't say, your job is this, and you stay in this category. Your job is this, and you stay in this category. Your job is this, and you stay in this category. He says, your job is mainly this, but you can check this person over here. <laughs> your job is mainly this, but you have this executive power, Congress. You can impeach the president. You can impeach the judiciary, but you can't be impeached. Hey, President, your main job is to execute, but you can give the State of the Union and you can veto laws. That's legislative power. Your main job is to interpret in your insulated judiciary lifetime appointments, but you can be impeached and you can determine if laws are unconstitutional, there's a check, there's a balance. He's definitely much more pessimistic on human nature. The Adams, John Adams was very, you know, gung-ho, Diego revolution. We shall all be in this together, brotherhood of man. Abigail Adams was like, eh, honey, have you met people? Madison was much more like Abigail in this way. He's very protective of property rights. And he was very fearful of unwise majorities inflamed by demagogues. What's, what's a demagogue? Sort of just maybe like more of a popular kind of pumps people up, kind of a rabble rouser. I mean. Populist pumps people up, rabble rouser. Any other demagoguery? It's specifically a leader who plays on emotion, particularly fear, to motivate the population. And it's much easier to do with an uneducated majority, because remember, Madison's talking about education too, and knowledge too, as property. It's much easier to do with the uneducated. So we have a separation of powers, legislative, executive, judicial, checks and balances, overlapping shared powers. Government is limited because of that ambition, because our ambition, we're able to play out our ambition, but so is the person next to us, right? Caleb wants to be the best wrestler, but he's not the only one, right? Government is limited by this, by division, by checks, by the fact that there is a federal system and so there are states. There are these limits that are in place. Speaking of checks, let's check attendance. So pull up your app. You got that, Eric? It is live. I think you have about two minutes. You have three whole minutes this time to figure it out. So if you have a problem with your app, like if you open it up and you hit on the three lines, and it doesn't show you the tab that goes across and there's attendance there and you pull on that and then you can click. If you don't see that, or if you're having problems with that, you might uninstall the app and reinstall the app. You have a little bit of time right now. If you're having specific problems, you cannot get it to work. As soon as attendance is closed in about two and a half minutes, raise your hand and Eric will come by and check on you. So the Federalists are going to support the Constitution. These are the framers. These are also people that agree with them. The Federalists are going to support the Constitution. 
And there's going to be Federalist Papers that are written. This would be a great time if I could do any part of the musical Hamilton, but I cannot. To talk about Alexander Hamilton and the fact that his ambition, which was very great, with, meant he devoted a terrific amount of time writing a lot of these papers. James Madison wrote those that we consider to be the most critical to theory. But Hamilton had a very strong hand in terms of power, executive power in particular. John Jay got sick, he didn't write that many. But Federalists were primarily large landowners, wealthy business merchants, professionals. So, you know, at that time, lawyers, right? Clerics, okay? Uh, physicians, maybe, but not really. Doctors were still quacks at the time. They're going to prefer weaker state governments. And that's not to say weak, just weaker than they were right then. A strong national government because we did not have one. Under the Articles of Confederation, it was impossible for the national government to respond to crises like Shays' Rebellion or the Whiskey Rebellion or any number of rebellions that popped up. And it was impossible for them to deal with the rapid deflation that had occurred because Great Britain, who was our BFF best friend forever and also trading partner, said, so if you got gold, we'll take it, but we're not going to take that paper money that you issued Virginia, Georgia, New York. We're just not interested. Give us some gold, give us some silver. And so there's rapid deflation so that farmers who were part of the yeoman army, part of the George Washington you know, revolutionary army, this idea of being taxed was a problem with them and who fought to be able to have their own bit of land. They borrow some money. When you borrow money in the springtime, what's it called? What's it called when you borrow money to grow your business? Seed money, right? Because that's what farmers did. They borrowed seed money. They planted, maybe they borrowed enough for a new, you know, Plow, share, a donkey, some clothes. They borrowed the money, and when they sold the crops in the fall, the deflation was so rapid that they got back less for their crops than they paid for their seeds. Which meant that now they were in debt and they couldn't pay it back, and so they started selling off parts of their land, or they were thrown in jail for being debtors. That's why such a large part of the Constitution does not allow that to happen. So even if we're talking about the protection of absolutely the interests of the wealthy, also the interests of those people who are just trying to make it are protecting the Constitution through bankruptcy and the fact that they will not go to jail for that. They prefer indirect elections, which means you know, we elect our state legislators and then they elect the senators from the state. We elect Congress and Congress determines who the president is. Or in the case of the way the Constitution is, we elect electors from our state and they determine it. Which I'll tell you, it's not the way it works anymore. I have a whole book coming out on it at some point, sooner or later. Longer terms, right? Four years, six years, two years. Government by the elite, people who are educated. And they expected very few violations of individual liberty. The anti federalists are going to oppose the Constitution. They're going to question the motives of the, motives of the framers. They're going to believe that the Constitution is an enemy of freedom. We're going to talk about the speech from Patrick Henry in just a second. And they're going to fear the erosion of fundamental liberties and the weakening of the power of the states. They want a weaker national government. They're small farmers, shopkeepers, laborers. They want a strong state government. They want direct elections. We directly elect the people who make our laws. They want shorter terms, just a year. 
They want rule by the common man, and they want strength and protections for individual liberties. Patrick Henry, who incidentally, during the time between the revolution and the time that the Constitution is being made, is in the Virginia House of Burgesses, and he's a pretty big fish. And James Madison does not like him. And he does not like him because he's smooth. And Patrick Henry talks and people say, yeah, good idea. And the person who benefits is Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was lining his coffers <coughs> because he was really good at swaying people with his voice. And so Patrick Henry says, hey, I got a problem with this constitution. It's not a compact of the states, but of the people because it says, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. Are they saying this is it? No. They're saying we're trying here. We think this is better. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. He says, eh, he doesn't even mention the states. It's all about the people. This is a problem. He said, our country has become a great, mighty, and splendid nation, not because government is strong and energetic, but, sir, because liberty is its direct end and foundation. One great consolidated empire, your government will not have the sufficient energy to keep these states together. Such a government is incompatible with the genius of republicanism. There'll be no checks, no real balances in this government. I dread the operation of it on the middling and lower classes. It is for them that I fear the adoption of this system. Federalist one responds, they're pretty mean. They say obstacles to the ratification of this constitution, and clearly some people haven't read, come from the interests of men who benefit from the subdivision of this nation into several partial confederacies, rather from its union under one government. In politics as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. In other words, hey, look, all that nice talk, it's fire, it's emotion, it's not logic. And you can't cure a foundation built on that. Of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics throughout eons, the greatest number have become their, begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people. They commence demagogues and end tyrants. Say, what about Patrick Henry? The framers, like I said, did not feel there needed to be individual rights in the Constitution, but there were. I mean, they actually included some. And so I think it's important to, to note that, that even though they said the checks and balances and the fact that it's a federal system, states are going to be protecting that in their own constitutions, there were still things included in the Constitution. The writ of habeas corpus was preserved. What does that mean, habeas corpus? Not jury. That's a little bit more. But to be told what your crime is. I mean, as simple as that, to be brought before a judge. Habeas corpus means bring forth the body, okay? In other words, to at least be told what you're accused of. Prohibited from passing bills of attainder. Do you know what that is? Has anybody ever seen the movie Judge Dredd, either the old one or the new one? There might be a third one, who knows? Can't see it. What does Judge Dredd do? He's just caught you doing something. What happens? You immediately, you're caught, and he passes sentence. That's a bill of attainder. Okay? Where the officer who arrests you also sends you to jail. Okay? That's prohibited. Ex post facto laws. You guys know what that is? Yeah. Exactly. So, for example, drugs are an interesting thing, right? 
There are designer drugs that come on the market faster than there can be laws made against them, right? So if ecstasy is legal, and it was in the early 1990s, and a bar had seriously like, you know, a bowl of ecstasy tabs. How do you know that? I've seen things. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> and you use ecstasy, or the bar was responsible for providing the ecstasy, and then the next day it's illegal. Can you be arrested for using it the day before? No. no. It's an ex post facto law. You can't make it illegal what I've done today. Okay, I can't be prosecuted for what I did yesterday. No religious qualifications can be placed on office holders. That does not only come from the First Amendment, that's super clear in the Constitution, the body itself. People cannot be required to be of a particular religion, to swear to a particular God, to have any religious leanings at all. Treason is narrowly defined and there are strict rules of evidence. You can't just be because you say, President's stupid, I hate my member of Congress, right? And then a right to a trial by jury in criminal cases is protected. And that gets a little bit more specific in the Bill of Rights. So, which side are you on? I have a poll for you. Okay, you have two minutes on this poll. Federalist, anti-federalist, more federalist than anti-federalist, more anti-federalist than federalist. Where do you stand? Where do you stand? You have a couple of minutes. There's some compromises to get states ratified. Incidentally, nine of the 13 states had to ratify. Okay, why nine? Can anybody tell me? Seventy-five percent? That's a nice big number, right? That's a greater than a majority. That's a good reason. But it's mainly because that's how many that they thought they could get, right? They kind of pulled and they thought, what do we think we can get? We think we can get nine states? Okay, let's shoot for nine. If they thought they could have gotten ten, they would have said ten. They thought they could get nine. So the Federalists, writing the Federalist papers in New York newspapers, and there are replies by Brutus and by other anti-Federalists, um, said, hey, look, just ratify this New York, and we will, the very first thing we'll do is we will put a Bill of Rights in this. And so together, Jefferson and Madison actually write about 19 those go to Congress, they get combined a little bit. It's, a, it's 1789, so right away, it's the very first Congress. They get combined a little bit. They're passed by Congress, two thirds of Congress, and then three quarters of the states to ratify, okay? And 10 out of the 19, but really it's more like 15 out of the 19, really, because they combine so many. And then, one of them became the 27th Amendment, which is our last, most recent amendment. Does anybody know what that is? That's exactly right. That members of Congress cannot give themselves a raise, right? They can give a raise that's effective after the next election, but not in the current election. And that was something proposed by Jefferson and Madison. And it was discovered in the 1970s by a college student who was supposed to write a paper on an amendment, right? He put this forward. He said, hey, look, Congress actually did, in fact, get passed. It did get passed Congress. It just wasn't ratified by the states. And it was put before state conventions. Three quarters of them passed it. It's the 27th Amendment. So we have the Bill of Rights, the first tip. 
And I want to talk to you for a second about the importance of flexibility. The United States has the oldest functioning written constitution. This is a big deal. You know, you're like, well, you know, it's been some time, right? 1787, it's 2022. That's, you know, 240 years. Seems reasonable. But understand, the United States is young. We're a young nation. There are nations that are thousands of years old that are existing in essentially the same form that they were a thousand years ago. The oldest functioning written constitution. A lot of it is because it's an ideal type document and it's vague. And so, for example, the Fourth Amendment, it says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, in their houses, and their papers and effects is written in 1789. And today, it means that a police officer can't search your phone without a warrant. Did phones exist? Little computers you carried around in your pocket in 1789 that have all your information? I mean, let's face it, the stuff you guys put on there. Okay, the stuff I put on there, it's ridiculous. And that's what the Supreme Court says. It says, hey, look, this is important to you. It's your personal effect, and that's protected. We can't look at it, the government can't look at it unless they have a warrant. Fourth Amendment. And it's not something that the framers envisioned, but it's absolutely what they meant. Okay? So we have 27 amendments. It's an ideal type document, not a detail. But anytime we try to do policy, for example, prohibition, we end up repealing it. It's always a disaster. Okay? So no policy in the Constitution. And I want you guys to think about how state laws shifts in population. You know, go west. The fact that California has 40 million people, a 12 or 12%, 12 percent, 12 percent of the population lives in California. Does it alter the original intent of the Constitution? Does it matter that they only have two senators and so does Wyoming? Think about those things. I want you guys to think about these things. Go to your labs on Friday. Don't forget, some of you, your labs have moved. Remember that your workbook chapter three is due on Friday. Remember that your homework in Cengage, all the exercises are due before class on Monday. 